All right, sorry for the uh, gap in episodes. I took a week off and was up at the Iceman Cometh, as I mentioned in the previous episodes, and I'll talk about that. It was really, 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 really fun this year, and I'm very glad I got on the wait list and patiently waited and got in and took the ride up there, so I met a couple cool people. And it was just just a great time. The weather was was perfect. So, and then we're going to talk about some other things. There's some interesting racing stuff going on, and I actually got quite a bit built up. Uh, I'll probably scale it back and save some for next week. So let's get going. This is Short Travel Magazine. Short Travel Magazine. Interesting tidbits. Curated just for you. All right, uh, tidbits. Well, this could fall under racing, but I'm going to put it under tidbits. Um, The cross-country eliminator. I bet many of you, if you have heard of it, you've never seen it. And it's a good chance you haven't really heard of it as a format. It's apparently only, only a thing in parts of Europe. Uh, the XCE is usually what they refer to it as. So I was looking on my YouTube, as I always do, and I don't know why, but that came up in my feed, a live uh, eliminator race, a World Cup, no less. So it's definitely a top event. And I was kind of bored, so I clicked on it and watched it, and it was actually something that caught my eye. Uh, it basically is four people, four racers at a time, in an urban-looking environment, I must say, although there was some dirt involved in a few places. But it's basically mountain bikers with four at a time on a BMX track, let's say. You have a start. They didn't have a ramp. They just had a flat start, and... Then you eliminate the top two, go on to the next round, and the next round, the top four from the last two rounds go until you get down to the final four, and then they they have the final. So for me, uh, you know, racing BMX for years back in the old days, uh, that's what you got used to. It was usually the top four. If it was an NBL race, you did a top four of each moto of eight, and then you get to the semifinals, and then the top four of that. And then you get down to the last eight riders, and that'd be the finals. So nothing new there, but they were on cross-country mountain bikes and looked like cross-country mountain bikers. And just like BMX, the start was absolutely pretty much the main differentiator. So if you got a whole shot and you were up, I mean, it wasn't always the case, just like in BMX, somebody could could go by you but it was very short i mean the races were i don't know a minute or two maybe so i don't know but it was cool because it was fast over quick looked like mountain biking really probably didn't need a mountain bike but still i can see why it isn't catching on anywhere else because it's just like a genre of a genre of a genre at this point you got your cross country, your downhill, your enduro. I think that's probably good enough, but still, it was interesting. And I will definitely, I made a note and flagged a couple sites that I will watch again. So if you're ever bored and you just wanted to check things out, that might be kind of cool. It's one of those events where a Pidcock or a Vanderpool, those type of guys with the sprints. The high speed power for short bursts, they would probably mop the floor with the current uh, racers there uh, just because it's such a short burst of power that they seem to have endless amounts of. Uh, so, interesting. Check that out next time. One thing I will say, I didn't recognize a single name uh, in any of the men's or women's categories, so it's clearly not a case of uh, cross country people kind of double dipping. Although, if you remember, they don't say it much anymore, but I believe Anna Terpstra or 
one of the elite women was the world champion of that event. I'm guessing going back now five, six years. I used to say it every time they brought up her name that she was the Eliminator world champion, which is, you know, now I don't think they even bother because I don't think anybody cares. So it's been a thing for a while. Check that out. Also under tidbits, um, the whole, all the sales going on right now, you keep hearing about how bad everything is with the bike shops and bike manufacturers and, uh, overstocked and, and there's going to be giant sales uh, on Black Friday. But this is also seems to be the time of year where I pull back from my spending. Of course, you know, with the holidays and all that stuff, there's a plenty of things to spend money on. But uh, being self-employed, my income usually takes a nosedive this time of year anyway. So as usual, when all the best deals come up, uh, I'm not in the mood to buy anything. For example, uh, a lot of manufacturers seem to be doing this on their own websites. So uh, Hayes Group, uh, Manitou, Sunringlay, they've got the uh, Mule Foot, the version 2, the new, uh, the newer versions of the fat bike wheels. $6.99 everywhere. I mean, Otso, uh, Wolf Tooth, they're selling their versions for the same $6.99. Um, and they got the nice 177 rear spacing, which is getting kind of harder to find, uh, for $4.19. And, and that was shipped with no tax out the door, $4.19. So 700 bucks to $4.19 for a brand new set of wheels, taped, ready to go for Fat Bike. That is a fair decent price um so if those kind of deals you know it comes out to i don't know 30 30 something percent off i think you're going to be seeing a lot of the 30 something percent offs um i did see a great deal i think competitive cyclist had a pivot mach 4 sl with the xtr xt build i believe it was the current 23 model i'm pretty sure it was judging by the looks of the frame the whole bike was like 7400 and you could get it for i think it was 48 4500 so again 30 40 35 percent off uh whole buy i mean that's that would be kind of where i'd be at if i was to buy a new one that's about as much as i want to spend that's why i'm not going to be buying a new one anytime soon uh, but maybe i keep that in mind for this time next year uh try and see try and see if I could find a deal. So I don't know if you're going to see these mu humongous blowouts like they keep talking about. They say it, that doesn't mean it's going to be that big of a deal. You know, 20, 30% crap's already overpriced, to be honest with you. So that's going to take more than that to get me to spend any more money. Um, I'm thinking of s taking every penny that I will have allotted next year for gear and spending it 100% on a coach. I'm going to try and find a coach to get me focused on the type of riding and training that I need to be doing to do better at these races that I'm going to do. I did eight. Looks like it'll be all of nine this year, which is plenty for me. I don't even get going until usually June and uh, usually stop. Uh, I just have a couple fat bike races at November, December. So um, I skipped a couple this year that I normally do. Um, so I don't know. It's just my equipment is maxed out. It isn't going to get any better. It certainly isn't going to help me do any better. And I'm thinking I'm going to invest something in a dedicated coach to at least tell me what I'm doing wrong and what I should be doing. Because I could be doing plenty of hours just doing the wrong thing. So it's kind of a waste of time at this point for me. I've been doing the same basic training for these races for 30 years, and I'm getting the same basic results uh, every year, and this year wasn't particularly one of my better years. So that's where we're going with that. Uh, what else? Uh, a couple other things. Let's get into some racing. There's a lot of good stuff there. Racing news and views. All right, let's get into some racing news. Um, Gunnar Holmgren, Canadian, signed to Bart Brenchen's KMC team. After all, this was rumored 
a couple weeks ago. It seemed like an odd fit for me, a team based solely out of the Netherlands where Bart is, with mainly close by European riders on the team. Um, but as people have noted, uh, the last World Cup in Mont saint Anne, Bart was talking about Gunnar Holmgren kind of more than usual, if you will. He had some great, great results last year. Definitely was one of those kind of young guys to watch. Um, so the fact that he signed full boat for Bart is actually really cool. I'm going to be very curious to see how this works out. He could be kind of, you know, the next up and comer. There's a couple of young guys that are on the way up, but they have somebody from North America. I consider Canadian U.S. racers almost in the same boat. I mean, they all do kind of race the same races, uh, you know, more or less around here. So I'm going to see how that pans out. Um, it sure has been quiet with the team swaps. Usually by now we're getting four or five weeks before the end of the year, which is usually when these contracts are up. Usually you get some hints, but uh, I haven't really heard much of anything. doesn't sound like there's going to be a bunch of changes for 2024 for the Olympics. Maybe a lot of the contracts were signed last year or two could, in purpose, you know, take riders through till after the Olympics. I don't know. But uh, that's something that is interesting. Also interesting is... If you can find it, go watch the Olympics 2016 uh, on YouTube. Somebody posted the uh, Rio Olympics. Now, that's only, what, seven, eight years in the past. That is not a super long time ago in the scheme of things. That's why I'm not going to put it in the old school. It's not really old school. But uh, that was quite an interesting race because... I mean, everybody knows Peter Sagan is going to dedicate himself full-time to mountain bike uh, cross-country next year, which everybody kind of laughs it off. I mean, he was at the World Championships. I don't think he amounted to much, but he didn't have a lot of training. But he says he's going to put in the work. He's ready for hard work, and he knows it's going to be difficult to even qualify. But just the fact that he's willing to do it is kind of cool, but... I wouldn't write him off. I mean, he is obviously past the prime age. He's already 35, I think. So he's not exactly a young up-and-comer. But he was in the lead group for most of that, and what he amounted to his whole race at the Rio Olympics. He was right up there with everybody, with Scherter, and he looked great uh, riding. He had some some flats and basically bailed at the end. But for the first lap or so, he was not one of these dudes who looked like he was kind of just going through the motions. He was hanging with them. So he definitely could do it if he trained properly. Uh, it'd be kind of neat to see if he has any success at all, even a podium somewhere, if that starts becoming a little more normal, which I kind of expected it to, uh, of a road racers coming into the mountain bike world at the end of their career. Uh, maybe not cross country, short track and Olympic, but certainly marathons or Cape Epics. And you've seen it plenty already. You know, you got Nibbly and people like that coming from the tour doing Cape Epics, but they, they haven't really been doing it to win. They're obviously doing it for the fun of it and all that. So, huh. Be really interesting. Uh, Nino looked like he was on 27.5 wheels, if you remember. He kind of rode those a little longer than other people. Uh, lots of hardtails and lots of names that are still around, the Flickiger and Luca Brido. So it's kind of neat. It's kind of like seeing those guys in their earlier stages, still fast, still up there. So that's just far enough back where you go, hey, that kind of does resemble, you know, modern mountain biking a little bit and again remember that's only 10 years or is that 20 years to us that's 20 years on from the first olympics so not that much has really changed uh, absalon of course was killing it that was kind of when he was at his peak so check that out i'm sure you could find it just google 2016 if you're bored it's good for 
half hour. It's pretty good camera footage. Uh, what else about racing? Well, somebody, uh, if anybody remember Elizabeth Brandau from Germany, does anybody remember that? I always remembered her because she, in my opinion, had one of the ugliest helmets. Uh, she always wore the bright orange Pock helmet, which an orange outfit and weird sunglasses. I don't know. It just kind of stood out like a sore thumb. I'm, that's probably the whole point. But she just looked kind of weird. But she was fast. And you know, it drives me nuts. They bring up that she's a mom. Oh, she has a couple kids. You know, mom. Who, you know, who cares? The, the lady's in her... was close to 30. I mean, that's hardly weird that she has a few kids. But I thought it was cool. Hardly worth mentioning every time they bring her name up. But unfortunately, her claim to fame is, of course... Uh, the short track where she took off on the second to last lap and just hammered it and thought she had the win only to find out there was one more lap. So that's just embarrassing. And I'm sure to this day she feels stupid about that. And it's one of, you know, in the heat of battle, how do you know? It's a wonder you even can see straight as fast as they go during the short track. But that's the last thing I remember about her. Then she disappeared and she hasn't raced at all last year or this year and so I just kind of googled her think I wonder wonder why she quit so abruptly no mention of a retirement you know they kind of mention that when a writer says you know hey this is it for me so it turns out she uh, had another child I think she said she has three and is just now like in the last few months kind of mounting a comeback she's on a local German team and she raced this summer, and she's doing cyclocross right now. She's actually winning some local races, and so I guess it's kind of funny that just the timing, and that as soon as I look her up, she actually is on the way back. be kind of cool to see her make a couple World Cups. I don't know if she's going to try and be World Cup competitive. She had a couple podiums uh, at World Cups, too, I think, and she also was the German champion several times. She was a European champion, gold, I think, silver or gold. So she had some speed and probably not exactly these giant sponsors. She's probably kind of working on her own mainly. So welcome back. If she makes it, that'd be kind of cool. I'll be following her. And what else? Let's let's move on. I, I want to talk about the Iceman a little bit. Even for people who don't go or have no intention of going, it was still interesting. Let's do that. Late to the party. Reviews of stuff. Long after everyone else has already had it. All right, I'm putting this one in late to the party because it is late. It's been, a, what, a week? Over a week. Uh, I meant to kind of get some stuff out last week. Just never did. So let's talk about the Iceman for a second. 30-something years, 33 years, I think, they've been doing this. Um... 5,000-ish riders, point to point from one city to another, around 30 miles start to finish. Um, they send people off in waves of around 100, and they start at like 8-something in the morning, and, and then the pros go off. I believe the last roughly around 2-ish, although I got some, I never really confirmed when that was. Some people said it was 1-ish, some people said it was 3 15. I wanted to watch the start. Um, so you basically have two options. You can park your car at the finish line, take a shuttle bus to the start, and then when you finish, you're right there with your stuff. Or do it the other way around. You drive to the start and then take a shuttle bus back. Well, last time, I've only done this once, about eight years ago, I parked at the end. Actually, I had my wife drop us, wife and kids drop me off. At the start, I took a shuttle bus to this. I mean, I'm sorry, at the end, at the finish line, took a shuttle bus to the start. Uh, you bring a duffel bag if you need some stuff, and you put a tag on it, and they'll, they'll send it back to the uh, finish line for you to pick up when you're done. That's how I did it. Problem was, it was pouring rain. I had nowhere to stand. I stood out in the rain. The tent was full of people. My bike was laying out in the rain, and it was a horrible experience, I'll be quite honest with you vowed never to do it again this year the weather was perfect so I had to make a decision I was all by myself this year my 
family bailed on the trip. So I had to figure out, okay, do I do it again that way? Do I get up early and get to the finish line and take a shot? So I decided to drive to the start and then take a shuttle back when I was done. Main reason being I could sleep a little later. I could eat breakfast three hours early at the resort, the headquarters of the race, and drive over there an hour or so ahead of time. Perfect time, take a little warm-up, right, all that stuff. Well, if I did it again, and I might, I would probably go back to the way I did it last year. I won't go into horrible details about the traffic jam trying to get to the uh, start line. That was a train wreck, if ever there was one, in my opinion. So I got there, made it okay. I didn't have any time to warm up or anything, but I figured after 30 miles, I'll warm up as we go. So um, I threw my GoPro on. I got some pretty good footage. Um, but to me, that's the race. Nobody really cares about my race. I get that. I don't know. I I finished within my predetermined half hour window that I set for myself and I could have probably done a little better had I known a couple things that I know now but the best part of that whole event to me is the expo at the hotel uh, Friday the day before the race it's just a one day thing from like 11 in the morning to I think it's nine o'clock at night and it's full of some really cool vendors and booths. And I remember that was one of the highlight of the, the last race, the last time I did it. But I had my wife and kids with me, and I we were tired. We had a long drive. So I didn't really get uh, too much exploring done that time. But this time, since I was by myself, I'd gotten there mm, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I got in my room and then headed down with my GoPro and got to go through that uh, expo with a very fine-tooth comb. And I really had some fun talking to people from my favorite companies. Trek was there, kind of. You know, they had a a bike. Um, What I ended up doing is videoing almost everything with my GoPro. And I'm glad I did because I can't remember a lot of the conversations I had. But there's some very interesting things came up. I did end up at a Meet the Pros where you, they had a schedule of, and the pros had to agree to this. They didn't have to do it. And this is the first year, so nobody really knew. So two pros that I really kind of wanted to talk to were part of this thing. Uh, they'd be there for an hour in pairs. And it was Riley Amos from Trek, right? Uh, under 23 who had a pretty kick-butt year. He was going to be partnered up with Casey Hildebrand, the guy I interviewed um, for one of my first episodes uh, from up in Wisconsin. He does quite well at this race. He's been doing it for a long time. I thought, oh my gosh, he's, that's perfect. I'd love to say hi to Casey in person and see what I could uh, do to talk to Riley. Well, I had a great interview. I ended up, uh, Riley was extremely nice and gracious. I could see why Trek or any large company would want to have him on their team. Aside from his, obviously, speed and skills, he just seemed like a really nice, normal young dude who loves bike racing. And I had a good 15, almost 15-minute talk with him, got to ask him all kinds of weird little questions that I've always been wondering. Uh, And I'm going to end up doing my first video based on the interviews with him and I talked to Wolf Tooth and Atso, uh, one of the head ups there, was, and we had a great conversation. I got to ask him all kinds of things about the new Voitech and why they did X, Y, and Z, and and I had a good talk with uh, Silka, who definitely caught my eye. I've been kind of looking to try a different sealant. I've been an orange seal guy ever since I went tubeless, kind of late, later in the game. And I've had fine luck with them. I can't really complain, but I've had a few issues with it drying out way quicker than I kind of expected. And Silka has been catching uh, a lot of uh, good publicity with their sealant and their ability to refresh it with a separate bottle of refreshing fluid. 
and they claiming a year up to a year and a half with one application if you refresh it properly so that to me caught my eye and I got to talk to them a while I actually came home with some of that stuff and who else was there um, now not exactly a cross-country uh, name Alexi Vermeulen who has actually won this race now two years in a row uh, he's more in the lifetime more of a gravel although he's been doing plenty of mountain bike stuff too over the years but He's, you know, he's not exactly, he's not a World Cup cross-country racer. Uh, but he's walking around and saw him quite a bit. And it was just a cool experience to kind of mingle. There's so many people there and so many cool booths. And a lot of the booths had stuff really cheap or, or pretty good discount. And I don't know, it was a great time. The expo was a highlight, in my opinion. It was even better than the actual race because it was compacted into one day and you could do it in a few hours it wasn't ridiculously huge i don't know it was a great time so i'm going to make a video i got lots of good stuff that i think anybody might enjoy and i will just say it's one of those events it's a little longer than i'm used to but it's not rough and then there's no there was a lot of single track this year i've been told more than normal i thought it was a perfect amount um, and anybody even if you're more of a gravel person in fact, I saw a few gravel bikes out there. It's still kind of best on a mountain bike, I think. But it was mainly, you know, there were some bottlenecks of single track where you get behind people who are kind of going slow to make sure it's, you know, they're safe. And that's fine. That's cool. You just have to accept, you know, not that I'm a speed racer, but even I was crawling about half the speed I, I could have been. Once you get around those little issues... It is a fantastic course because it's wide and there's some incredibly fast downhills and some really nice large uphills, which I did not walk on a single one, by the way. Uh, eight years ago, I walked up most of them. It was muddy and horrible and I was out of shape. And everybody else was jumping off, so I joined them. Well, this year, I didn't jump off anything. I rode the whole course. That was pretty cool. So watch for my debut video coming in the next week or so. Um, I think you've probably have something interesting there for anybody even if you have no intention of ever heading up to northern michigan in november it's still pretty cool all right let's do some what should we do next let's do some gear talk changing gears more new stuff we don't really need all right first up let's talk about danger home has anybody seen these bikes that this guy named danger home puts out uh, he works with scott bikes and tricks them out and paints some cool colors and does weird things and makes them super light and most of the parts are kind of unobtainium freaky stuff i don't know it was kind of cool the first couple that he did he take like a scott spark and shave the cranks down or paint it really cool or make a uh gravel bike that's his newest one out of a hardtail they're beautiful bikes and there's no question ridiculous amounts of hours and money went into them but i i just don't get the need to keep doing that over and over i'm curious as to uh how he's being compensated is he selling these things for 25 grand afterwards is scott paying him to do this i don't know i find it quite kind of getting to be bizarre but anyway, let's talk about something more completely the opposite of Danger Home, the boring old Trek Pro Caliber aluminum frame. I'd put this in the category of kind of what Specialized did with their chisel frames where you make, you know, a relatively inexpensive aluminum frame with the exact same kind of specs and angles and geometry as their full carbon race bikes at a reasonable price now trek if you've ever known if you're not a trek boy that's fine but they have several aluminum hardtails in their range um, that are probably i believe one of them the marlins was like their best seller they're in the thousand dollar range fifteen hundred dollar range a nice sweet spot i would imagine for somebody coming in Probably still has sticker shock that it costs fifteen hundred bucks for a aluminum twenty nine inch mountain bike with pretty crappy parts by you know us us uh, 
idiots who spend way too much money on on mountain bikes. But um, they they were getting rid of the Excalibur, which was kind of in between, and they're just going to be calling them Pro Caliber and an aluminum, and it looks doesn't have any ISO speed couplers or anything. It's just a nice aluminum hardtail that would make a great kind of starting bike. Or I'm thinking, if it was me, wouldn't it be cool? Just work with me here for a minute to put Trek factory racing on one of these aluminum hardtails or throw a, aluminum top fuel just occasionally. Wouldn't it be kind of neat to see a team actually use less than their absolute insanely expensive bicycles with some of the racers? Uh, they can't, if they could win or do well, I mean, what's the downside? They don't, you know, is it really going to make a difference if somebody's on a carbon hardtail or an aluminum hardtail? Is it going to make a difference if they're on the um, Super Caliber 9.8? You know, run a full out-the-door OEM build. The only sponsors they really have other than themselves is the Pirelli tires and I see they're even putting Pirelli tires on some uh, new bikes already so throw some different tires on if you will or leave them but I would love to see one of these teams anybody ride to throw a stock bike not the top of the line and show people that hey these bikes are equally as capable uh, of being successful never happened obviously but just got me thinking that Pro Caliber Aluminum is really a nice looking bike and could be built up into a very lightweight, completely raceable uh, weapon if somebody wanted to do that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, what else? There's also something I geek out on this stuff. Uh, SRAM has a, a new bleed block. You know, the little plastic pieces you put in between your disc brake uh, pads when you pull the wheel out. So that if you squeeze the lever, you don't completely screw up your... Uh, pistons and have to push them all back in but there's the universal bleed block it's basically red plastic but it, the way they design it to me is very clever it's uh go check it out just do a youtube search for sram universal bleed block and you'll see it's around 15 bucks so not mega dollars but it's really cool to well, you'll see it. It's one of those tools you go, now, why Why wouldn't every bleed block come like that? Why wouldn't they put a little bit of thought into these things? Everything else is already more complicated than it was in the old days, right? Disc brakes require about five times as many tools and bleeders and devices and gizmos. And then if you have two different brands, SRAM and Shimano, now you need two different sets of this and that and maybe two different jugs of fluid and bleed blocks are different you know all this stuff right it's already more complicated so this kind of universal bleed block is a really good solution that i might actually pick one up i don't do a whole lot of brake work my brakes seem to work but it's one of those tools that caught my eye going oh, that that actually is a better idea so kudos to sram on that they should actually be throwing those in the box with their brakes i don't know if they're going to do that or not be kind of dumb to have this cool tool and then not include it but i've seen dumber things with a lot of these companies uh lastly i'd like to talk about silka i mentioned it in my earlier uh blabbing about the Iceman. they had a nice booth their tools their allen wrenches their hex keys are they were so nice in the, in the case they came in was so nice that i actually said to a guy who was standing there i go i, I don't know if i could actually use these on my bike I would actually would rather just look at them. I mean, they're in velvet, hardwood, beautiful wood case. The paint on them is immaculate. Super cool. They weren't even, they're not even that crazy expensive, you know. Silka has been known to have some kind of goofy expensive stuff. I wouldn't put that in the goofy expensive category. I think it's more like you get what you pay for category. That's different to me. I, I'm okay with companies charging twice what another company does if it's actually an improvement in something you keep for a lifetime so it got me looking at some of these silka videos they've got a youtube channel 
And if you watch these videos, there's a guy on there who is a very good speaker on camera, I must say, but he explains the amount of trial and error and testing and thinking and proving and all these things about virtually every product they sell. And he watched it on their great video on their um, tubeless sealant. It actually explains why they did everything, the versions they went through to get to where they wanted to be. Anyway, I ended up watching like 10 of their videos. I couldn't stop. Uh, and it's kind of now brought them uh, to the forefront as one of my kind of cool favorite companies that I'm going to be trying other things from and they're based right out of Indianapolis, Indiana, the next state over. So another cool Midwest company. Silka with their logo and their name always sounded very um, kind of European to me. And I believe I mean, I'm going to have to go do some research and maybe I'll talk about this next week. There is a history, uh, a long history of that name that they took it over at some point. I could be thinking of somebody else. So uh, it's one of those companies I think you might want to check out. Just go to the website and, uh, again, it's not meant to be the cheapest stuff, but if it works and it's better, I'm okay with that. So let's wrap it up with what else? Eh, that's good enough. We got uh, 36 minutes going in. So let's uh, wrap it up. I hope everybody had a good week and fat bike season has started. I did my first race Saturday. Uh, did not go well. Let's just say it was not one of my more uh, successful races. A couple things all went wrong, and I'll talk about that next week. It's a good kind of a lesson. The things I'll talk about that went wrong might be things that other people have done wrong and have had bad luck with. And you think after 30 years of doing this, I'd have figured out all this stuff, but it just seems like every year I just keep screwing things up. Same. I guess that's what makes it interesting is to try and do better in the next one. So that's it right now. Go watch some cyclocross. There's some good ones. The big heavy hitters, Vanderpool, Pidcock, uh, Wout. They're not going to be doing anything for a while. So you got kind of the uh, the diehard long-term whole season racers, Isabert, and there's a couple of them. Vanderhaar, they're going strong. They're still cool races to watch, and they've been some some really good mutters uh, over there the last uh, week or two. So if you're bored, go check out some cyclocross, and I'll see you probably Friday to get caught back up on my schedule. All right, talk to you. Thank you ever so much for listening to Short Travel Magazine. 